Somebody say amen. Omar have decided that today is the day that he wants to go down into the water of grave and give his life to Christ. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. So again, upon baptism, we recommend that Omar be accepted as a member of Solomon's Ministries. Seal pledge. So moved. And everybody said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Say hallelujah and praise the name of the Lord. Amen. We bless God. We thank God for this uh, awesome, auspicious occasion to uh, take people down in the watery grave of baptism. Amen. A renewal of our commitments to God, some for the first time, some is a renewal. We give God praise. Amen. Thank you all so much for making the decision. Uh, to follow Christ and to have him as the center of your joy. Our, sorry. Can you hear me? Our first to be baptized is Raina Mike and Eli Allen. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. 
we have to be baptized is Patricia Evans. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Patricia Evans is the next candidate to be baptized. Brother Lonnie Code to be baptized. Amen. Amen. Praise God. It was Joshua and Caleb that finished the job and led the people into the promised land. That's what I see in these young men. Amen, amen. And so we, we want you to stretch out your right hand towards them as we baptize them, that they might become leaders and warriors in God's kingdom and tear the devil's kingdom down. Because of your profession of faith and joining and enlisting in the army of the Lord, we would let them baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He is the brother of the young gentleman that, that was just baptized. Amen. 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 A couple of Sabbaths ago, um, I kind of looked around and I said, how you doing? And, and where's your mom? And, uh, you know, he said to me, he said, look, sometimes they're a little bit slow. Uh, so I got to get to church. You understand? Yeah, yeah. So I like that spirit about him. Yeah, yeah. He said, you either get with me, you understand, or, or you got to get, 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 get going. So I, I like that spirit about you. Uh, and and be, we with pleasure now uh, enlist you in God's army. And we pray the anointing of the spirit of the Lord upon you that you might do great exploits for God. 
because of that, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we do it all in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen. Yes, sir. The next person we have to be baptized is Omar Key. Baptisms are always a special occasion. Uh, they are very memorable. The day that you're born, the day that you die, the day that you get married, the day that you give your heart to the Lord, and the day that you are baptized. They're milestones in your life. You never forget them. Uh, if your heart has been touched by this uh, ceremony today, and you're saying in your heart, listen, I, I want to get baptized as well. Uh, we'll stop the service now and let you get dressed if you want to do it now. A amen. Amen. And if you raise your hand, uh, we'll carry on and, and work it out and, and, and allow you to get baptized because that momentous occasion is so uh, important. And is there, is there one today who said, Pastor, I wanted to be in this baptism and I, I didn't know it, but I'd like to get baptized now. Uh, we'll wait on you. Amen. We got a robe for you and all that, you know, uh, we can't do nothing about your hair and your weave and your wig, but, you know, but, but, you know, we'll, amen. Uh, if not, if you say, Pastor, I'd like to be a part of the next one. I'd like to be a part of the next one. Uh, it's my desire and I'm planning in my heart uh, to be ready for the next baptism. If you are that person, you raise your hands and we'll make sure that uh, you are prepared. If you haven't been baptized or you want to be rebaptized and you want us to help you get ready, uh, we'll do that. Is there someone here who's, who's that? We're not going to bring you up front or nothing. We just want to acknowledge you and, 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 and say we, we want to get you ready. Amen. 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 Let's just have a quick word of prayer. Seal these decisions. Our Father and our God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen today, our ears have heard, our hearts have palpitated, and we have felt. And so we ask God that those who've made their decisions to be in the next baptism, that you will surround them with your angels who excel in strength, oh God. Keep them committed to you and their eyes on Jesus. And then when it's all said and done, God, we shall stand before the sea of glass. Give your praise. Lift up our hands throughout eternity for what you've done and for what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Yes, sir. Come on, put your hands together and give God praise. To all of you, we thank God for you. Uh, I'm a Baptist boy, so this is going to be an old Baptist song. So 
simply goes down through the years. The Lord's been good to me. Down through the years, I know the Lord's been good to me. Oh, I know the Lord, the Lord's been good to me. Tell you that the Lord really been good to me. I'm trying to tell you that down through the years, the Lord's been good to me. Down through the oh Lord have mercy, the Lord's been good to me. Oh, I know the Lord. I come to tell you that the Lord really been. It ain't no dream. Well, shake me, wake me to the break of the hour. I tell you everything I see. I'm trying to tell you that down through the years, the lost been to me. I come to take it at the Lord really been good to me. Now by this time I pass the word of God and say, He's been good, He's been, He's been good. I know the Lord, I know the Lord, He's been good church, He's been good church, He's been good, He's been good, He woke me up.
heads for a word of prayer. God, I thank you for this aggregate of believers. I pray right now that through the agency of your spirit, you would quench the thirst of every soul. I ask humbly that you would do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And in this sermonic time, I pray that you would convince us, convert us, transform us into who we should be. We're not going to waste words begging for your presence. Because we've sensed your spirit is already here. So I pray right now that you would not allow anything that is wrong with me to get in the way of what is right with you. And I ask that you would give us clarity of thought that we might hear, thus saith the Lord. Speak, for your children are listening. We ask these things in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. Um, if you've been blessed thus far, go ahead and put your hands together. I am really excited today to be here um, today is a good day. It's a good day. Um, God is certainly here. And I have a sneaky suspicion that you didn't wake up early on a Saturday. Try to rush to eat breakfast, jump in your car, and waste your good gas to come and sit silently like a statue in the sanctuary. But I have a sneaky suspicion that somebody made up in their minds today that I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. I want to thank each and every one of you today uh, because I, I sense that the Spirit of God is here in this place. Um, if I could just let you guys know something, um, this younger generation, you can't really fool them. Uh, we sense vibes, and real recognizes real. And we know that this is a place where love abounds. There's a sense of genuine sincerity. And there's a lot to be said about that because we don't want to be Christian in name alone. Uh, people should feel the love of Christ when they walk into the house of the Lord. And I want to tell you that that is a direct reflection of the leadership that is here. Uh, your pastor, Pastor Lewis, is a down-to-earth, loving, disarming man who doesn't look down his sanctimonious nose of snobbery at people around him as if they are below him. No, there's a, a sense of love there, and that is reflective inside of the culture and the life of the church. So if you don't mind, put your hands together for your pastor, for the leader of this house, the angel who God has blessed us with, and for just all of the leadership, the elders, the, the leaders, the young adult leaders, um, those who've been involved in just kind of preparing this day, um, there is a lot that has gone into what has transpired thus far. And we just celebrate all of you who sacrificed your time and your energy and your gifts to build the kingdom of God, to provide us with an opportunity to fellowship with one another and with the Lord. Um, great job. Great job today. Great job. Um, many of you, the likes of which I admire, the heights to which I aspire, 
Uh, we're, we're in the presence of some amazing and anointed individuals. Um, as was mentioned earlier, my brother is here. Milton, wave your hand in the back, Milt. He's here. That's my youngest brother. They're four, four boys, and that's my youngest brother, and he is a man in his own right. Uh, he's visiting from Atlanta, and he's trying to figure out, y'all, if he wants to stay here in Orlando. So y'all better be nice to him. Show him that this is an amazing place to be, um, and maybe he'll choose to stay. Um, I also want to give a quick shout-out to all of the baptismal candidates today. Everybody who went down in the watery grave of baptism, that is a huge move, huge move, huge move. And for all of you who didn't clap your hands right then, shame on you. Because every time, every opportunity you get to support, encourage, uplift, inspire someone, especially who's making a decision for the Lord, you should seize that opportunity with all the energy and passion that you can put into it. So I'm going to give you one more chance. Let's put our hands together and celebrate what God is doing in your lives. Man, what a blessing it is to see people who are doing what the Lord told us to do. The Bible says, believe, be baptized. The same shall be saved. You guys made a, a very special decision today, and we celebrate that decision. Um, let me go ahead and tell you that um, this mountaintop experience that you've experienced today as everybody is, is clapping and celebrating you, I want you to drink it in. Right. Enjoy it. Uh, this is a transitional period in your spiritual journey. And let me be the first to say that the Christian church, not just our denomination, but the Christian church in America has not done a really good job uh, in the transition period of those who've made that decision for the Lord. Truth is, a lot of us oversell and underdeliver right. when it comes to this Christian journey. And I don't want to be like the, the Wizard of Oz who presented himself as some majestic being who could answer every problem and provide any assistance. And then when Dorothy and her friends show up, they recognize that it ain't no majestic being. It's some humble man behind a curtain. Let me go ahead and, and apologize. I want to apologize for the Christian church who has presented itself as some majestic, perfect being who can do anything but fail. We are not perfect people. We are humble people who will do our very best to provide for you the needs that God has given us the ability to provide. And we want to let you know that you're not in this walk alone. We support you. We are your family. You can open up and rely on us because we have your back. We have not come to this place of perfect performance in our journey. As a matter of fact, guess what? You joined a group of sinners, sinners who are saved by grace. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm too real for some of y'all. I, I mean, if you think you're perfect and you're a little uncomfortable right now, let me kind of remind you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So you today, making that decision to go down in the water grave of baptism, um, we celebrate it, and we stand with you, not above you. We stand beside you, and we're here to show you the love of Christ that you so sincerely deserve. So we celebrate you. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to our scripture today. It's found in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. Derek, I see you and your family. Good to see you, bro. Um, so many amazing people. First Kings chapter 19, and we're going to read starting at verse 1. Let me tell you, my wife and my daughter are not here today. Uh, they had to stay in Houston. We have a bunch of family members flying in from out of town for my daughter's first birthday tomorrow. Uh, so she kind of had to play host, hostess there. But let me tell you, time flies. You parents didn't tell me, man. You, you, you hoodwinked me. I didn't know that, number one, you would not get any sleep. I didn't know I would be this tired. But then on top of that, y'all didn't tell me how time flies, man. This is her first birthday. So she's there. She sends her love. And I miss her. So um, let's go to, to the word of God. If you could stand for the reading of God's word, let's honor it today. I appreciate you for doing that. 
First Kings, the 19th chapter. It begins like this. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow, then he, that's Elijah, was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey. Somebody say a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Skip down to verse 9. And it says, There he came to a cave and lodged in it. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Today I would like to preach under the sermonic title simply, When Enough is Enough. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, brothers and sisters, I didn't come here to entertain you. I came on assignment, and I need you guys to know that it does not matter how long you've walked with the Lord. There will come some scenario, situation, some struggles that will have you scratch, that will have you place your head in your lap, and the only thing that can come out of your mouth are the words, enough is enough. Back home in Houston, I have some friends, author family, wife, and is there another mic I can use? Yes, thank you. Back in, in Houston, Texas, there's a family, the author family, husband and wife, and a little girl who's about two years old. They've had a crazy year thus far. The husband's father unexpectedly just died, had a heart attack, and then shortly after, the wife's brother died from the exact same thing. And in the midst of all of this death that is taking place in their life, going from funeral to, after, to funeral, uh, they were blessed to find out that they had conceived, they were with child. They, with excitement, went to their first doctor's appointment to hear that heartbeat, and when they showed up, they were informed by the doctor that they had a miscarriage. They are struggling right now because while time has passed, grief has not passed, and they're yet trying to hold on, and the truth is they are scratching their heads, and they have declared in this season of loss in their lives enough is enough. I know a woman named Gloria Smith who lives in Houston, Texas, and she has two children, one boy who is 13 and one girl who is 16. And Gloria lives with them alone because her ex beat her so bad that she had to have multiple brain surgeries. She's now wheelchair bound, has sores all over her body, was just recently diagnosed with lupus. And in the midst of all of this, she found out that her disability benefits were denied. So she's now stuck trying to take care of her family, growing boy, growing girl, with a total of $400 every month to take care of her rent, food, and everything else that she needs to take care of. She called me the other day and told me, Pastor, I want to give up. As a matter of fact, I've already made arrangements. My son will stay with the football coach. My daughter will stay with the school counselor because the truth is 
if I take my own life or if I just die, allow myself to go down, they would benefit from the life insurance. She wants to throw in the towel. She wants to give up. And she, in essence, was telling me over the phone, Pastor, enough is enough. The end of the first finals game on Thursday night, I sat and I watched the news that came on directly after the game was over. The first story that pops up, a woman in Houston, a young woman who has three children, where she was walking with her family into her apartment when two young men, one 17 and one 19, came up and robbed her at gunpoint. Rather than just taking whatever she had, they decided to spray the family with bullets. And the youngest daughter did not survive the gunshot. She was only five years old. The interviewer was asking her questions and was giving her story right there at the grave site of her youngest daughter. And as she's sitting there with tears in her eyes, articulating the pain and grief and sorrow that she's currently going through, this woman was in essence telling the interviewer, enough is enough. I hear you right now telling me, Pastor, I understand that you have some friends who are going through. You could go down the line and turn on any news station and give me a soliloquy of all of the trials and tribulations of our world. But, Pastor, you ain't even got to do all of that. Just drive down my street. <laughs> Pull up in my driveway. Why don't you walk into my house and you'll notice, Pastor, that I've had to, on my sojourn, go through some seasons of loss of depression, of struggle that is so bleak and so strong that I just literally had to throw my hands in the air. I had to let my head fall down. And the only thing that I could come up with were these words, enough is enough. Now, at this moment in the sermon, I'm about to separate the real from the fake. Because the truth is, there are some of you in here who can testify, some of y'all who could stand up and say, you know what, um, I've had some moments in my life where my back was against the wall, where I didn't know where my next paycheck was going to come from, when I couldn't figure out how I was going to provide for my children and supply the needs for my family. You know what, I'm talking to you today. Now, let me stop here. I'm separating the real from the fake. If you're too super spiritually saved and you are super spectacularly Christian and you go into heaven anyhow and you done memorized every hymn, you memorized every scripture, you eat Genesis for breakfast and Revelation for dinner. If you too blessed to be stressed, if you are too anointed to be disappointed, if you are too equipped to be with, I ain't talking to you today. I didn't come here to talk to those type of folk who act like life doesn't hit you across your face sometime and slap you so hard you lose your equilibrium. You knock off balance because of the unexpected occurrences of life. No, I didn't come to talk to those folk who ain't going to be real today. You know who I came to talk to? I came to talk to the folk who can holler at the preacher and can say, I've had some moments in my life when enough preacher was enough, when my money was funny, when my husband was getting on my last nerves, when my children were acting like the seed of Chucky, see the seed of Chucky, and at the end of the day, my house wasn't like the Huskables' house. I, my house was more like a Nightmare on Elm Street. I I, didn't, I can't tell you all of what it is. I came to talk to the folk who can tell me today and holler at the preacher and say, you know what, preacher, I've had some dark nights and I've had some weary days. I've had some trouble and some trial and some vicissitudes and some unexpected situations that have knocked me on my back. But today I came to talk to you today because God gave me a message. Yeah, he, he gave me a message, y'all, because at the end of the day, someone in here knows that you can be saved but still have some sorrow. Yeah, yeah, somebody in here knows that you can be blessed and still have burdens. You can sing in the choir and still be confused. You can still sing in the praise team and have some problems. You can be a preacher and still deal with perpetrators. You can be a deacon and still deal with disappointment. You can be an usher and still look at some ugly situations. At the end of the day, I know there's some people in here who can say, preacher, I know what it feels like. 
I know what it feels like to go through some stuff that literally will have you on your knees and you're struggling to make it through. You've been pushed to the very limit of your endurance. And preacher, I got, I've come to testify. Look, if you ain't talking to anybody else today, you came here to talk to me. Because the truth is, I need some inspiration on my journey. I need a little uh, pick-me-up because I've been going through, going through. And right now, i got to just tell you, and I'm feeling what you're saying thus far, enough is enough. I wish I had a church today. Enough is enough. And let me tell you, this is exactly what's going on in the story. Um, because the prophet Elijah, Reverend Elijah, Pastor Elijah, he, he's dealing with some disappointment. And he's also dealing with some apparent defeat. And I want you to know that things have gotten so bad for the prophet that he's overwhelmed and he's overburdened. So much so with the feelings of abandonment and fear that he's sitting under a broom tree and he, listen to what he's saying, he's begging God to put the final period on his story. He's asking in a very real and transparent way. He's saying, God, this is enough. Take my life because I'm no better than my, I need you to just go ahead and close the final scene. I need you to shut this thing down. I'm throwing in the towel. I'm giving up. I don't want to deal with this any longer. I'm actually, I'm tired of being tired, and the drama is too overwhelming. And if anybody in here has been there before, I'm done with what I'm dealing with. I'm not going to keep dealing with this mess. I ain't going to keep dealing with this drama. I want you, Jesus, to go ahead and just end it all. You would be surprised to consider the number of people who are overwhelmed like Elijah with pain and hurt. I'm not talking about people outside of this room. I'm talking about the people in this room who you have no idea what they're really going through. They walked up in here trying to be positive with a smile on their face. And you know what? If you could really, with eyes that could see, consider what it is they're going through. You know what? You would start smiling at folk. I feel like the Spirit is telling me to sit right here. You know, you know what? If somebody in here could see how many people are buckling under the, the immense weight of the burdens of this life that are now pressing down on their already tired shoulders, somebody in this place is trying to tiptoe through the tunnel of tension and, and pain. Somebody in this place is struggling, and they've been pushed to the very limit of their endurance. And I wish that we would just be more nice to people because you never know what folk are going through. You know what? Smile at somebody. Why don't you ask them, how you doing today? Why don't you be the first person to step up and try to engage them in a conversation rather than walking around like everybody got to talk to you before you talk to them? No, you know what? Some of us Christians are so nasty and trifling. We walk around here like we are just too big and too great to stoop down on somebody else's level. You better believe that they're folk who are going through. You better believe. Stop walking around here like you smell and smell. Spoiled veggie meat all day. Walking around with your, your nasty and foul attitude. Not knowing that all somebody might need to get them through is a simple how you doing, sweetheart. It's a simple what's going on, sweetheart. How is life treating you? And stop asking them for the automated response, everything is okay. Because if they open up and say things ain't good, you say, all right, I'm praying and keep it moving. Why don't you stop being so super spiritual and start empathizing with people? I wish I had a church today. We got to be nicer. Christians, see, some of us wouldn't even, people wouldn't even know we're Christian unless we said it with our mouths because our demeanor and our behavior is so doggone nasty. Some of the meanest people you'll find in church. And people walking up in here with the burdens on their shoulders of life. And at the end of the day, they came here to be loved and to be shown that God has not, you are not alone, sweet. Listen, young lady, I know you're feeling like you're fighting this fight alone. Young man, I know you feel like the world is against you and ain't nobody there to help you out. But today I need to speak life into you. I came with a word to inspire hope in the hearts of the hurting. And I need for those of you who are struggling and those of you who are feeling a 
abandoned. And those of you who are actually frustrated with God. You don't know how God can be all powerful. How he can have all. He's an omni, omnipotent God. And at the same time, since he spoke spinning worlds in existence, he's sitting idly by. While the threats and the problems and the trials of life are hurled into my existence, I came here today to talk to you. I came here today to expose the lie of the enemy. You do not have to sin silently with the strain and struggle of your journey. I came, I came here to expose the enemy. You are not alone. And I need for you to know that you don't have to fight this battle by yourself. You'll be surprised how many people are depressed, discouraged, sad, hopeless, unmotivated, disinterested in life in general. Okay, so the Anxiety and Depression Association of America talks about how there are 15 million people who are dealing with major depressive disorder. Let me tell you how this translates. It translates into people committing suicide at such an alarming rate that it, it, it really translates into one person taking their lives every 40 seconds. And we, we act like people are just supposed to walk around like nothing's going on. And when we see signs of discomfort and displeasure in someone else's life, it's someone else's duty to step up and try to help them along their journey. So suicide is actually the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29-year-olds. So many people commit suicide a year that you can take war casualties and all of the homicides in the world and combine them together and still not get the same number of people who are literally taking their lives every day. This thing is real. And I'm, I'm tired of tiptoeing around this problem called depression because Christians act like you got to put on a mask called happy when at the end of the day you are truly going through some sincere trial and trouble at your home. I know you smell good, you look good, and you came in here trying to just put a good face on. But if we can take the mask off and stop acting like at the end of program, Oscar awards will be given out to the best actors and actresses in our 11 o'clock hour, that is not why you came. You know why you came? You came here to, in a very sincere and real way, fall to the feet of Jesus and let Jesus know I'm tired. And at the end of the day, some of us are struggling with even believing in a God. Because if God sits up high and looks down low, then why am I still going through what I'm going through? And I came here today to tell you, you are not alone. That people all around you are dealing with the heartache and pressures of the life that each of us has to sojourn through. So I, I, I got to worry because, look, Elijah in the story, he's dealing with this, this type of depression that is so serious that he's literally seeking to commit suicide. He's depressed. He's dejected. He feels like he's all alone. And I need you to know that, that and he, I only got two points today, depression and anxiety will do two things. Number one, it will cause you to experience a loss in direction. I hope you like the person you're sitting next to. If you don't, it's your problem. You sat next to him. I want you to look to him and say, God is telling me to encourage you today. I mean, I don't know. That person's kind of hating on you. They didn't like what you just said. They acting brand new in the house of God. I want you to turn the other person close to you, and I want you to tell them, say, God told me to tell you. Be encouraged, my brother and my sister. Yeah. Let's go ahead and break the tension right now. Because in the story, I need you to know, Pastor Elijah was not always here. Pastor Elijah was not always in this place of feeling burdened by all of the issues and troubles of, and trials of life. No, no. You do know that Elijah is known as being a prophet of God who is always on assignment. 
He ain't always been here. You ain't always been here. Let's, let's, can we go through just the story? Because this is the same prophet. He's the one who went all the way to the king and prophesied a famine in the land. And just by the declaration of his word, the skies ceased to release rain. Three and a half years of famine. No, no, no. He's the one who was told by God to go to the brook at Cherith. And he enjoyed the catered meals that were provided by ravens sent by God. He's the one who, when the brook dried up, was sent by God to go to this widow at Zarephath. And after she and her son gave the prophet their very last meal, he prophesied into her life. And he declared that her oil would never run out. And just by the declaration of his word. Miracles took place. He is the one. I need y'all to know who we're talking about. Elijah is the one who stood on the lofty heights of Mount Carmel. And Elijah is the one who posed the question, the solemn question, how long ye shall halt between two opinions? The Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Y'all know the story. Elijah is the one who called down fire from heaven and consumed his altar while the false prophet stood there next to an altar unconsumed. Elijah is the one who was given a godly mission to guide the king in the midst of blinding rain all the way from Mount Carmel to the gates of the city in Jezreel. This man was given supernatural power, gifting, and ability. And if anybody knew Pastor Elijah, they knew him as a man always. No, 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 no. Not sometimes. Always on assignment. I need you to ask somebody, say, are you on assignment? Because Prophet Elijah is, is always on assignment. But guys, I need you to know, what, what is he doing right here? He's now with the bright lights of Carmel still glistening in the pupils of his eye. After experiencing all of the great miraculous power that God chose to exhibit through his ministry, this man named Elijah is not doing some miraculous uh, exposition of God's power. No, you know where he is? He's by himself, sitting under a broom tree, talking about God take my life. Is this the same man? Can I stop here and tell you? Just because people have been used by God doesn't mean they're not susceptible to deception and to, de and to depression. Just because God has used somebody in times past does not mean their fleshly or human side of being tired and overwhelmed will not sometimes overwhelm them. I need y'all to know that Elijah was a man who was full of power, but in the same scene, Elijah now switches over to being overwhelmed and depressed. And I need y'all to know this. Did you know that life? is not static in nature. It's dynamic. I need these baptismal candidates to get this too. Because while there were high, high, lofty heights at Carmel, they were almost immediately followed by deep valleys. You ain't going to always wake up with a sense of get up and go. Sometimes your verb, sometimes your vitality, it leaves you. Sometimes your get up and go has gotten up and gone. And here he is, this man, Elijah. And, and I, I need y'all to get what happens here. Uh, I'll throw this in here. We're, we're dealing with this theme this weekend called fit faith. One of the issues with Elijah is that he was doing so much. He was always on the go. He forgot to take care of himself physically. This is, this is true. And it's evident because when he asked God to take his life, he then goes to a cave. And then God tells him, come outside of the cave, and, and, and there's an angel, an angelic host, who shows up, and he says, Elijah, this, this journey is too much for you. You got to eat. He tells him to eat, eat, and then he goes back, and he goes to sleep. He wakes up again, and does God then give him a spiritual revelation? No. He says, deal with your physical first. Eat again because you're tired. You're emaciated. And at this point, you need to deal with your physical self. Can I stop here and tell you? Many of us who are dealing with depression need to understand the vitality of taking care of yourself. Because the truth is, your brain is the organ of thought. 
the brain of psychology, the mind of psychology is the brain of physiology. In other words, your brain is an organ that must be taken care of just like your feet, like your hands. Some of us are so, especially, man, I'll be real with you, especially black folk. We like, we, 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 we hate going to counselors. We hate dealing, but we want people meddling in our business. What, what do we do? We try to deal with that stuff alone. Your knee blows out, guess what? You're going to go to a knee doctor. But your mind is overwhelmed, but you refuse to go to anybody who can help you deal with the organ of thought. I need you to get this. You need to get rest. Let me keep it moving. You need to deal with the physical self and stop trying to be some spiritual person who does not have a physical body. The spirit cannot be ministered to when your body has been utterly neglected. You need to take care of yourself or else you will inevitably become a person who is always having these highs and then these lows because you refuse to handle business physically. Why don't you go on a walk every once in a while? Stop drinking soda all the time. Drink you some H2O. I don't know who I'm ministering to right now. I'm ministering to myself, to be honest. Yeah, you got to drink some water. Go on a hike. Why don't you wake up early in the morning and guess what? Go to sleep at night. I'm preaching to somebody today. Some of you, your circadian rhythm is so off. Because you don't have any routine, you refuse to just follow the laws of nature, and you up all night and try to get two hours of sleep during the day and think you're going to do something. No, some of you, your immune system is so shot because you ain't get any hours of sleep. Y'all, if you don't go to sleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., your immune system is compromised by 50%. If you don't go to sleep between the hours of 12 a.m. and 7 a.m., your immune system is compromised now by 30%. You got to get some rest. Elijah wasn't taking care of himself physically, so here he is trying to commit suicide. Hand your business. So, so that was a, a, a parenthetical statement, kind of an inclusion. Um, here he is. Elijah is by a broom tree, and look at what the Lord tells him. When God finally gives him a word, he poses a simple question. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, I'm talking now about a loss of direction. This is what depression will do. Why are you here? See, hear this. It was the here of the doing that disturbed the Holy Ghost. Elijah, here's, here's God talking to him. Elijah, hold up. I'm the one who sent you to the king. I'm the one who sent you to the brook at Cherith. I'm the one who sent you to the widow at Zarephath. I'm the one who put you on the lofty height of Mount Carmel. I'm the one who gave you the ability and strength to lead the king through the blinding rain. But I have one question for you. Who sent you here? What errand of mine are you running here? What errand? Are you running to build the kingdom of God? Who are you ministering to now? In other words, Elijah, why are you here? You have suffered a loss of direction. And this happens. This is why I need to break it down for you. Because when you're struggling with whatever it is, whether it's financial difficulty, whether it's being overwhelmed because your kids done lost their minds, I don't know what it is. But I, all I know is this. Many times when we're facing trials, we try to become logical and, and stop becoming spiritual. Elijah, I feel like I need to teach more today. Elijah is in this place in life where he's heard a threat from a woman. That's a message in and of itself right there. All it took. This mighty man of God. All it took. Jezebel talking about I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. And what does the man of God do? I'm out. She ain't going to find me here. <laughs> she's going she to have to catch me. He hears a threat. And what does he do? He tries to remove himself from danger. And what he does is makes the logical decision 
rather than the spiritual decision, and he removes himself from the lofty vantage point that God would otherwise have him occupy. Some of us need to know the weakness of our current position when compared to where God really wants you to be. Because you thought your bills were so overwhelming that I'm going to take what is God's and put it toward what I think I need to handle. That's the logical decision, not the spiritual one. I got issues with my relationship, but rather than taking it to God, I go and talk to all these nasty, these, uh, these, these drama, these, these, my friends who can't keep their mouths shut. Most of them ain't in a fruitful relationship anyways. And we try to make the logical decision rather than the spiritual decision. Isn't that what Eve did at the Garden of Eden? God didn't have your best interest at heart, Satan was saying. At the end of the day, if you eat it, you'll be just like God. And what does she do? She tries to make the logical decision rather than the spiritual decision. And God is telling some of you in your depressive state, don't you dare revert to being logical rather than be remaining spiritual. Because here he is running for, for his life, and he's under a broom tree. And God is like, who can you minister to here? What are you doing here, Elijah? I have a question to ask you today. What are you doing here? Why have you sidelined yourself ministerially so that you aren't doing what God has gifted you and given you the power to do through his spirit? Why aren't you exercising your gifts and talents for his kingdom? Why have you started, why have you relegated yourself to the corner of spiritual insignificance because you're scared? You're scared that I won't be able to provide. You're scared that I'm not good enough. You're scared that what people have said about you might be true. And God's like, get your behind back in the game. Why are you over here, Elijah, in a cave? Who can you minister to in a cave? You don't hear the word? If you keep reading, you'll notice the very next thing God tells him is, Elijah, this is what I want you to do. Go and anoint Hosea. Go and anoint him. You know what? After you go and anoint him as king in Syria, go and anoint Jehu as king over Israel. Oh, and after you're done doing that, I want you to then go and anoint this man named Elisha because he's going to take your place as prophet. So you need to, in other words, stop sitting idly by. And I want you to get back in the game and do what I've told you to do. The question is, if where you are currently located is not a direct reflection of God's directions and, and itinerary for your life, then you need to consider what God needs you to do right now and where he wants you to be. And you'll know whether or not you are where you need to be because ain't no peace there. Mm. I want to preach it, but I got to teach it. Colossians says, let the peace of God rule your hearts. In other words, when I'm in the center of God's will, I might have physical pain. I might be going through some dramatic situations. But you better believe that when God has given me my marching orders, it doesn't matter what I face in my life. It doesn't matter what my journey might throw my way. You better know I'm going to have peace. What? I don't care what they said about me. I don't care where they, what they, what they, they, they watch this. Some of us don't even get sleep at night because we're too worried about what everybody's saying about us. And that means you ain't where you need to be. Because if you are where you need to be, I don't care what nobody said. You better believe I'm getting some sleep at night. I'm going to lay my head on my pillow, and I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. I did what you told me to do. And guess what? He just lulls me right to see. He sings me a lullaby. And I go to sleep every night, and I wake up energized, ready to do his bidding. Why? Because I've not made the praise and adulation of other people my primary objective in life. You know what? Paul said, I didn't come here to get everybody's appreciation. He said, I wouldn't even be a servant of Christ if I was doing that. You know what? I don't care what people think. At the end of the day, I care what God thinks. So let's, let's just deal with this loss of direction. If you are not in a place of peace, consider this, that you might very well be in an alternate location that is different. It's derailed you from your destiny, and you need to now consider, God, where do you want me to go from here? I need peace. I need forward progression in my spiritual journey, and I'm tired of spinning my spiritual wheels. Where should I go? And watch this. God will always speak to you. You got to be willing to go. 
But God will always tell you where it is you need to be. So here he is. Elijah finally gets the word. This is your marching order. Go there. Go do this. Go do that. And you know what he does? He gets up and he goes. But not only does depression give you a loss of direction, but lastly, depression will give you a loss of discernment. Loss of discernment. I hope y'all are writing this down if you're not tweeting and on Instagram. Um, just give me, give me a few more moments of your time. Elijah is sitting under a broom tree. I need y'all to get this. Elijah has no business pouting when he should be praising. Let me hear you. I need to, to get somebody in here to understand that Elijah, where he currently is, has no business being suicidal when he should be giving God shouts of glory. Let me tell you why. Why is he doing what he's doing, where he's doing it? I'll tell you why. Not only does he have a loss of direction, this man has a loss of discernment. He doesn't even know how to look at his current situation. And I want to help you all today. I'm about to give you some shouting material. Because Elijah, here's the story, heard from Jezebel this message. By this time tomorrow, if you're not dead, like those prophets of Baal that you killed, may the gods deal with me ever so severely. In other words, you dead, homeboy. <laughs> you're done. You know what? Let me give you a date on it. By this time tomorrow, I'm going to take you out. I don't care how I need to do it. You better believe that she was not railing some empty threat his way. Jezebel was a wicked woman who did not speak without putting everything that she had behind her word. If it was evil, you better believe she was going to try to do it. And this woman was trying to take the man of God out, but hear the story. He had a loss of discernment. He didn't even know how to look at his situation. You know why he should have been shouting rather than being suicidal? You want to know why this man should have been praising rather than pouting in this moment under the broom tree? Because Jezebel said, by this time tomorrow, you'll be dead. And then the Bible says, he went a day's journey and sat under a broom tree and asked God to kill him. Some of y'all didn't get it. Jezebel said, by this time, I'm talking to y'all over here. Jezebel said, by this time tomorrow, if you're not dead, may the God deal with me ever so severely. But Elijah then, the Bible says, went a day's journey, sat under a broom tree, and then while he's sitting there, ask God to kill him. Y'all didn't get it either. I need to talk to y'all over here. So let me tell you the story. Elijah was told that Jezebel was going to kill him. When? By this time tomorrow. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, he went a day's journey. And after going a day's journey, he sat under a broom tree and he asked God to kill him. Y'all sleep. Okay. Can I talk to y'all over here? So here it is. Elijah hears... A threat from a woman that I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. The Bible says he then goes a day's journey and then is sitting down under a broom tree asking God to kill him. They're almost there, but I think y'all are going to get it. Elijah, here's a threat from a woman. By this time tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. And then the Bible says, Lord, help me. That he went a day about this time tomorrow, and he's sitting under a broom tree talking about, God, kill me. Does anybody in here know that people will try to put an expiration date on your life? And is anybody in here just willing to testify that while God has allowed the threat to come your way, those who put an arbitrary expiration date on your life, God says, don't worry about that because you're still fresh. <laughs> Will anybody holler at the preacher and let him know that some of y'all in here were given because of that type of cancer. You can't live past a few months, but all of a sudden you live in a couple years later talking about some, I don't know what you were talking about back there because your expiration date is not valid in my spiritual journey. 
Some of y'all, somebody said you would never graduate from high school. And all of a sudden, you're walking around here with some degrees from a university and from a college. Walking around here with a PhD. Exceeding the expiration dates of other people. Some of y'all have heard people tell you that you cannot do it. You cannot go there. You cannot accomplish this. And look at you right now. Walking around victorious. Like a winner. Living beyond the expiration dates of other people. I don't care what folk tell you. I know this, that God's word is all that matters. And I refuse to allow the expiration dates of other people to sideline me. J.D., you can't preach the word of God. You can't go here or do that. The devil is a liar. You better believe that I'm going to do whatever God tells me to do. And I'm going to do it as long as he tells me to do it. And if anybody here can agree with me that God's word trumps every negative naysaying Negro in this world. Trying to get you to be depressed. Spewing their cynical negativity at you. Did you let that stuff bother you? I've been, oh Jesus. I wish I could pass this mic around. And hear all of the expiration dates that done passed a long time ago. Sitting here complaining? You better give God praise because you are where you are because of the sustaining, because of the amazing and mighty, because of the all-loving, all-compassionate God who cares. Sitting here depressed, Elijah, you should not be where you currently are. You know what's funny? In your complaint, you have a reason to, to give God praise. Because you would not be able to articulate your very complaint if God didn't put breath in your body, if God didn't give you ability in your limbs, if God didn't allow the blood to still run warm in your veins. God, even in your complaining, needs to get praise. So, Elijah, he done lost discernment. Let's go ahead and play something, man, so we can, we can end. <laughs> Elijah's struggling. And while he's sitting here talking about enough is enough, I've had enough, Lord, take my life. You, you, you ain't provided me with enough support. Milne's going to sing an appeal song. But as he's preparing, I need y'all to get this because, oh, Jesus. You over here talking about enough is enough. But you're not the only one who has that very phrase on his mind. Because the story doesn't end with Elijah in a broom tree. In a suicidal mindset. No, 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 no. God, he senses your pain. He won't leave you in your dark night like that. His plans are sure. His destiny for you is certain. And while Elijah, one moment, was asking God to take him out, all of heaven was paying attention. All of heaven is moved by any Christian who is going through some trouble and trial and feel dejected by this world. You are not alone, and God wants you to know it. So what does God do? God sends heavenly help your way. He sends a messenger like me to remind you that you're not alone and to inspire hope inside of your heart. Don't you throw in the towel. Don't you wave the white flag. You are not done yet. Don't you prematurely end your story. Why don't you see what the next chapter has to hold? Watch this. Watch this. The story doesn't end because five chapters later. Look to somebody close to you and say, hold on. Hold on. Just hold on. Five more chapters. Hold on. Because... Five chapters later, when you get over into 2 Kings, the second chapter, you'll believe it. You'll, well, hear this, hear this. Elijah and Elisha are walking and talking. No, Elijah didn't stay on the sidelines. He got back in the game. He went and anointed Hazael. He went and anointed Jehu. He went and anointed Elisha. And while he's doing his, he got back in the game, y'all, while he is playing the game. He's being ministerially productive. All of a sudden, the Bible says 
horses and chariots of fire. Come flying down out of heaven. And they start descending in their glorious and majestic glow. And while Elisha and Elijah are walking and talking, they see this amazing display of celestial glory. And while the chariots and horses of fire are flying down from heaven, the Bible says they split Elijah and Elisha. And you know what Elijah heard? Elijah heard a very simple phrase, one that maybe he used one time before in his darkest moment when he thought he was not going to make it through. You know what he heard? He heard the voice of Jesus. What did Jesus say in this moment? Jesus stood up on his celestial throne, looked down through the corridors of time and space, and he told in a very simple way. He said, Elijah, enough is enough. No more tears. Enough is enough. I've seen what you're going through, Elijah. And the Bible says that as they are split by the, these horses and chariots of fire, all of a sudden, in a whirlwind, this prophet who one day wanted to give up and throw in the towel is now being transported from heaven into heaven. From this ugly and sin-cursed earth. Why? Because God said enough is enough. If you want to hear an encouraging word, hear this. That when God says enough is enough. No more pain. Enough is enough. When God says enough is enough, there's no more sorrow and no more drama. No more dealing with your crazy exes. Enough is enough. No more dealing with diseased visitation. No more dealing with all of the drama in your, when God says enough is enough. You will be translated into a place of pristine and perfect paradise. If you would just hold on. Speaking to every person who needs. You gave me my hand. You need to hold on just for a little while longer. To reach out to men. Oh. To show them your love. Mm. And your perfect plan. You gave me my ears. I can hear your voice so clear. I can hear the cries of sinners, but cannot wipe away their tears. You gave me my voice to speak your word, to sing all your praises to those who never heard now I'm emptying down my cup so that you can fill me up oh now I'm free I just want to be more available to you so, Lord, I'm available to you. Oh, my will I give to you. I'll do what you say. Do use me, Lord, to show someone the way. And enable me to stay. My storage is empty. And I am available to you. Oh, Lord, I'm 
available to you. Oh, my will I give to you. I'll do what you say do. Use me, Lord. Show someone the way and enable me to say my storage is empty and I am available to you. One of the things that the Spirit of God has given me is a level of discernment that I'm learning to trust. And in this moment, I sense that in this place, there is a heaviness. I felt it. At the beginning of my message, God provides me with these revelations so that I can be sensitive to his spirit's voice. And what I want to do is I want to, in the moment, symbolically lift the burdens off the backs of every person who is now struggling under the immense weight of the problems and trials of life. I know you are struggling. You might not have articulated it to other people. You might be living paycheck to paycheck, but folk think you live in large. At the end of the day, there are some people who are struggling behind closed doors, and we today tell you that it's okay to be sorry um, for all of the mistakes that you've made. It's okay to be struggling with the guilt of your past. It's okay to be frightened about the future that is before you. It is okay to not be okay. It is okay to not be okay. It is okay to not be okay. Because you are not alone. I don't care if you're a leader in this place. I don't care if you're a visitor or just a regular member. I need for you in this moment to in a level of transparency and with sincerity in heart, I want you to tell God, I need you to help me. Help me to continue to hold on. Help me not to throw in the towel. Help me to remain positive when so much negativity is coming around me. I need you to help me, Jesus. And I don't care who sees it. I don't care who's going to try to figure out what's going on in my life. I don't care about the naysaying crowd. I just need to touch the hymn. Woo, if I can just get to the pharmacy in God's hymn. If I can just provide the power that is so desperately needed in this place. God is trying his best to let you know that you can make it. That you can get through. That you will stand. You will continue to move forward in progression, progression in your life. If you today needed this word. Because, some, because people don't really know what's going on. I'm not going to pass around the mic. I don't need you to articulate to everybody in this moment what you're dealing with. I just need you to be real enough to say I'm going through some stuff. Christian or non-Christian, I am struggling. So, if that is you in this moment, I need for you to like these two people have done. I want you to stand as a symbol that God, I'm not ashamed of my experience and my journey because I'm not looking or caring about what everybody else is thinking. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yeah. Forever. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Now. Glory to God. I'm encouraging you that you're not alone, but I also got to give you this, this solemn word. You cannot stay in your cave any longer. You're not safe there. You're not productive there. Logically, you're saying this is where I need to remain because I'm scared of what's going to take place outside of the cave. God says, trust me. Don't you dare relegate yourself to being logical when I've called you to be spiritual. And if I did those things on Mount Carmel, if I provided for you when the brook dried up at Cherith, if I'm the one who sent you to a widow who gave her very last meal to you, if I've provided for you before, why don't you trust that I'll continue to do it? 
You don't know where it's going to come from, but that's through your faith. Faith is not needed when you can see. So God had to strip all apparent evidence of providence, and he needs you in the dark night to start walking by faith. Because you ain't got no choice. You can't see. <laughs> so trust me. Trust me. God's saying trust me, and it's time to emerge. Emerge from your cave of spiritual inactivity, of spiritual insignificance, of ministerial sidelineness. And I want you to get back in the game. I want you to start using your gifts and talents for my glory. I want you to start chasing your dreams with a reckless abandon. I want you to start taking the revelation that I've deposited into your life and start walking toward it. And living like I'm going to give you everything you need. And stop looking at what is around you. When my sight is in contradiction to what he says, I got to go with what he says over what I see every day. So this is your moment. This is your faith moment. This is your, your, your time. This is your time. You're going through. God will provide for you the strength to make it through. But God will not do for you what he's given you the power to do for yourself. So the next moment, this next, this next appearance. It's only for those who say I'm struggling, but I won't let my struggle sideline me. I'm going through some problems, but I will not allow my problems to snatch my prophetic mantle. I must get busy in ministry again, and I must start doing the work of building God's kingdom. I got to get back to that place of productivity. That's where I need to be. So here it is. If that's you, you don't want to just say, God, I'm struggling. And when he shows up, you stay in your cave. It's time to come out your cave. Come right here to this altar. As if your seat is where you've been hiding. As if where you're standing is where you've been relegated. I want you to walk out, emerge. Emerge from your cave and come here. Come here to your spiritual effectiveness. Come here and claim your spiritual anointing. Come here and walk in your divine destiny. Come here and draw near to the, the throne of grace. Yeah. This ain't for the faint in heart. This ain't for those who are about lip service. I'm struggling, God. Help me. God says, I'll help you, but help yourself. Use what I've given you and get back into the game. Ah, I still feel the heaviness. Father, in this moment, I'm praying that you would please. Please, through the agents of your spirit, tug on the hearts of your people. And help us, Lord. Help us where we cannot help ourselves. Give us the faith where we lack it. And allow us, Jesus, to today try you, put you to the test, and see if what you've, de you've declared will actually come to fruition. Every person who's struggling right now, I pray that you would help them, Jesus, to see that they are not alone. And I also ask that you would give them the ability to abide in your presence. Don't allow us to lose our direction and to lose our discernment. Put us back on the road of spiritual significance. Help us to know that you sense our very feelings and emotions. And God, you are moved by the feelings of our infirmities in Lord today. You want us to know that your hand is moving on our behalf. And the favor of God is resting on every individual who is standing in the need of prayer. God, I intercede on their behalf. Some of us can't even pray for ourselves. So I pray for those who can't even utter a prayer to you. I pray for those who are spiritually weak. For those of us who are struggling, I pray that you would be their strength. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 